world, I'm Missy, the Time Machine Teacher, and this is Unit 4 of the amazing Review a Race to a 5 to get you ready for the AP exam. If you're new here and that sounds like something you're interested in, make sure and hit subscribe and don't forget to turn on your notifications so that you don't miss a thing. All right, grab your notebook. Let's get started with Unit 4. First thing we're going to talk about with Unit 4 is the context. So Unit 4 is 1450 to 1750. During this time frame, the gunpowder empires are expanding and the Europeans are expanding their empires as well through forming maritime empires. Also during this period, the hemispheres connect because of Christopher Columbus's voyage to the New World. Before his voyage though, it started with the Portuguese and Spanish who were exploring new routes and possibilities to Asia. And this happens because the Ottoman Empire has taken over Constantinople and they are now in control of the trade routes and access to Asia. So the Europeans need to find a different access point. Once the Americas are established, the two hemispheres are connected through trade. The demand for goods increases due to the Crusades as well as these new trade routes and new products being found and technology and innovations in technology makes this all possible. The big question in 4.1 is how does cross-cultural interactions spread technology and make trade and travel possible during this time? Let's first start with who this involves. The maritime empires are set up by Spain, Portugal, Great Britain, France, and Holland, and they're all in competition with who can have the biggest maritime empire. As I said before, new technology makes this possible. Most of the technology is coming from China. It goes to the Islamic world. They innovate it. And then it goes to Europe where it's continued to be improved upon. So every time these cross-cultural interactions happen, things improve because of ideas from other cultures being added to the technology. One example is the magnetic compass, which helps steer the ship. Also the astrolabe, that allows sailors to see how close they are to the equator. The caravel, which is a smaller ship that survives storms and goes a little faster. Photography or map making is also improved upon. Those improvements will lead to an astronomical chart, which maps the galaxies and the sky. These maps will help discover wind patterns as well as navigation. The, the gunpowder empires that we talked about in Unit 3 were successful because of gunpowder. The maritime empires will also use gunpowder to build their empire. One advantage that they had was that the Americas didn't have the technology such as guns and gunpowder that the Europeans had. If you're familiar with the germs, guns, and steel theory, that's Jared Diamond's theory as to why the Europeans had the technology where the Americas didn't. And it basically goes back to geography and the fact that the Europeans were lucky in that they had access to resources and domesticated animals that the Americas didn't have. If you're interested in that, make sure and check out his video, Germs, Guns, and Steel. It's from the History Channel. I will link it in the links below. Part two and part three are particularly interesting and will help you on the AP exam. So if you have time, make sure and check those out. There are also some push factors. There are also some push factors that push people to explore. For example, demographic changes, such as the primogeniture law. That was a law that allowed the eldest son to inherit all of the land. So if there are younger sons, they didn't inherit anything and they were forced to find a living in a different way. Also, religious minorities that are being discriminated against sometimes needed an escape, such as the pilgrims who came to the New World. The leader in navigation at this time was Prince Henry the Navigator. He financed expeditions as well as led them into Africa in search for gold, and he also started the maritime slave trade. With Newton's discovery of gravity also came the knowledge of how the tides worked, which helps with navigation as well. Unit 4.2 talks about the cause and effects of the state sponsoring maritime exploration. So we mentioned some causes before of push factors and the need to find new trade routes, but another cause was that the Italians had control of the trade routes close to the Mediterranean Sea, mostly because of their location. And this is also going to influence the Europeans to find alternate routes because the Italians were able to set the prices and sometimes that was to the detriment of other Europeans. Europeans are also looking for others to convert to Christianity. 
So you have your three basics. They were looking for gold, God, and glory. Gold would merely mean wealth, and they're competing to be the wealthiest of all the European countries. God, converting others to Christianity, and glory, of course, is the rivalry for glory, the rivalry to be the best. All three of these things entice them to build their empires and claim more land. Mercantilism is also a guiding principle at this time. It means that Europeans measured their wealth by how much gold or silver a country had. In order to maximize their wealth, they want to export more than what they're importing. That way it keeps the wealth within the country. And that is the way mercantilism worked at the time. As we said before, the Portuguese took a lead in this discovery and navigation. Prince Henry the Navigator, who led expeditions, Bartholomew Diaz, he made it all the way around the southern tip of Africa. And Vasco da Gama, who was the first to sail around the southern tip of Africa and make it to India. There he claimed several seaports for Portugal. The Portuguese maritime empire was vast and very hard to maintain. At the time, they were able to build this empire because their ships were superior to most European ships. They were able to conquer the Arabs and take over Malacca, which is modern day in Indonesia, which is modern day Indonesia. They also traded with China and brought in missionaries. The Jesuit missionaries that were brought in also brought with them science and technology. They failed to convert very many, however, they did spread knowledge. Many of the scholar gentry were not very receptive because they looked at outsiders as barbarians. They controlled their vast trading network through the requirement of having a trade permit in order to pass through the waters. Their goal was to have a monopoly over the spice trade. However, this was hard to enforce because they didn't have enough ships or men. Also, corruption and private traders challenged this system. The Dutch and the English were also competitors. The Spanish now come on the scene with Ferdinand Magellan, who was the first to circumnavigate the world. That means that he went all the way around. By 1521, the Spanish had taken over the Philippines. The Filipinos resisted at first, but the Spanish were able to conquer them. Manila becomes the trading center for the Spanish, and Christianity also spreads during this time. The goal of finding riches led many to the new world. As we said, gold, God, and glory were three causes of exploration. The Spanish did find some gold among the Aztecs and the Incas. They also found silver, and the silver trade begins. China didn't want manufactured goods, however, they did have a demand for silver. The Spanish used natives to mine the silver, then they sent it to Manila in Spanish galleons, which were very large ships. And from there it went to China. The Spanish used coarse labor, or the Mita system, which they adopted from the Incas in order to force the natives to mine the silk. The Mita system was where young men were required to perform public service. It was dangerous work and many people died. Historians actually believe that the work was so brutal that during the time of the Spanish Empire, there were around 8 million deaths caused from working in the mines. China begins to use silver as their main currency. Let me give you a little context about that. In the 16th century, the Ming Dynasty is in charge. The Spanish Empire is also waging wars in Europe, which cost their empire a lot of money. Around the same time, the Chinese decide to reform their tax system. They're the first to invent paper currency. However, with the invention of paper currency comes the temptation to just print more money if you need more money, sometimes the government doesn't have gold to back it up. This happens during the Ming Dynasty, and as a result, inflation occurs, causing the paper money to lose value. So at that time, the Chinese switched to metal currency. Also around the same time, the Chinese government has the people pay taxes with rice. Because of these reforms, what the Chinese government decides to do is mandate that the people pay their taxes in silver instead of rice. So now China is in need of a vast supply of silver so that the people can sell their rice for silver and be able to pay their taxes with it. This law goes into effect in 1580 and China starts to get silver from Japan and Spain via Latin America. At that time, Manila becomes the main trading port because that's where the Spanish galleons take the silver. There are several effects of the silver trade. 
Short term, it really helps China as well as Spain because China is getting the amount of silver that they need in order for the peasants to pay their taxes, and Spain is getting gold and silk and luxury items in return. Mm -hmm. However, in the long term, there's too much silver in China and it floods the market, causing the price of silver to drop which leads to more corruption and weakens the economy. Long term in Spain, when the price drops, it also hurts the Spanish economy. One positive effect is that it fosters a great global exchange, and some historians would argue that this is the first time that globalization is occurring. It also spurs on an export industry in China as they are exporting products to Spain. Let's move on now to the French, English, and Dutch. They're all in the New World searching for the Northwest Passage, or the route to get to East Asia. Most of them think that there's an easy way to do that. Looking at a map now, we realize that that's not the case, but at the time, that's what they were searching for. The French begin exploring in Canada, and they get heavily involved with the fur trade, realizing that this is very lucrative. They also spread Christianity while they're there, and one of their explorers, his name is La Salle, makes it all the way to the Mississippi River and the Mississippi River Valley and claims it for France. The French aren't really into sending settlers. Mostly they're there for profits from the fur trade. On the other hand, the English send settlers, and in 1607, they start a settlement called Jamestown. After that, they will continue sending settlers to the East Coast. The Dutch send Henry Hudson to look for the Northwest Passage. He doesn't find it, but he does build New Amsterdam, which will eventually become New York. New Amsterdam becomes very important in the Dutch fur trade. Another piece of information to note here is that the English have a very bad relationship with the Native Americans, mostly because they are coming in to settle the land and take land from the Native Americans. Whereas the Dutch and the French have a little bit better relationship with the Native Americans because they are coming in to trade and establish fur trade with the Native Americans versus taking their land. Moving on now to 4.3, which is the causes and effects of the Columbian Exchange. The cause, of course, is the linkage of two hemispheres via these new trade routes. And the effects of the Columbian Exchange are best. One is diseases. The Native Americans did not have domesticated animals. Therefore, they didn't have the diseases that the Europeans had because the Europeans had gotten immunity from those diseases because of domesticated animals. Depending on location, somewhere between 50 to 90 percent of Native Americans died because of lack of immunity to these new diseases the Europeans brought in. Another effect of the Columbian Exchange were the animals and the foods that were traded. For the most part, the animals and foods traded improved the diets in both the New World and the Old World. Horses brought by the Europeans enabled the Plains Indians to hunt the buffalo more efficiently. Because of being able to hunt the buffalo more efficiently, they are able to survive in the plains much better. They live off of everything provided from the buffalo. Potatoes became popular in the old world because they were cheap to grow, so the poor were able to benefit from this. More meat was added to the Native Americans' diet in the new world, and their population did improve because of that. One negative effect of the Columbian Exchange was forced labor and cash crops. Cash crops are crops that they grow to sell rather than eat. This becomes a problem in Jamestown because so many of the settlers want to grow tobacco instead of actual food to eat that this leads to starvation. They basically were depending on the Native Americans to provide the food for them so that they could grow tobacco instead. Sugar plantations in Brazil are run by the Portuguese. They at first used Native Americans to work in the plantations, however they were dying from diseases or running away, and that is when they started importing Africans. On these sugar plantations there were horrible working conditions and many died. The transatlantic slave trade is another effect of this exchange. Most were going to the Caribbean or South America and some went to the British Americas. This leads to what's called the African diaspora or the spreading out and as a result there was a lot of cultural exchange for example languages spread and mixed and one example of that is Gula and Creole music will later be influenced by African style such as jazz and hip-hop and new foods were brought over such as rice and okra there were also devastating effects on the environment for example deforestation causes erosion soil depletion from overusing the soil to grow cash crops and the overgrazing of domesticated animals 
which eventually leads to soil erosion as well. There were other effects such as improving communications between the two hemispheres and learning new warfare and hunting techniques. 4.4 talks about economic and labor systems. Two words in this unit are very important and you may see them again on the AP exam, state building and empire building. They mean similar things. Literally, state building is building your state, making it bigger. Empire building is building the empire and making it bigger. There are several reasons why this happens, which we'll get into as we talk about this. Let's start in Africa first. The Portuguese make contact there with the Congo and the Ashanti Empire and start building a relationship for the transatlantic slave trade. They also take over the Swahili states. In Japan, at first, they were closed to outsiders, but some will convert to Christianity through the work of missionaries. And some of those Christians were not very tolerant. They went so far as to destroy Buddhist temples. In the 1630s, the government of Japan expelled all foreigners, banned foreign books, and also banned Japanese travel abroad. They did continue some regional trade and allowed the Dutch to come in. In China, Zhang Ho had taken many voyages but after his voyages were over, the Ming tried to block all communication with the outside. They were trying to undo the changes made by the Mongol Yan Dynasty. They also reinstate civil service exams and go back to more Confucian philosophies and principles. During this time, there are several European rivalries trying to build the best and biggest maritime empires. British, Portuguese, and France all have trade in India. An example of that is the British-owned East Indian Company. They take advantage of the strife between the Muslims and the Hindus. They employ Indian soldiers and continue to move further inland. Eventually, the East India Company will control almost all the trade in India. The Spanish control Mexico, modern-day Peru, and Florida, and the trade in those regions. The Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494 divides the land on a meridian between what the Spanish control and what the Portuguese control. The French and the British are enemies in North America. The French have control of the Mississippi River and the Ohio River Valley area. The British have control of the East Coast. Dividing that are the Appalachian Mountains. The colonists in the Americas want access to the land in the Ohio River Valley, and the French won't allow it. So the British and the French go to war over this. In Britain and France, they're also at war. It's called the Seven Years' War in Britain and France, and it's called the French and Indian War in the Americas. The Native Americans, or the Indians, take sides with the French. We talked about before how the Native Americans had a better relationship with the French because of the fur trade. This is part of the reason that they side with the French. They also side with the French because they don't want their land taken by the British. There were some Native Americans who fought on the British side, but the majority will fight with the French. The British end up winning this war, and then the colonists want to go over into the Ohio River Valley area. Unfortunately, the Native Americans are still not okay with this, even though the French and the Indians lost. So they start attacking the colonists. When the colonists ask for protection from the king against the Native Americans, the king refuses because he had already spent enough money on the French and Indian War, and he doesn't want to spend any more protecting the colonists who are going into that land. This is one of the reasons that it will eventually lead to the American Revolution, because the colonists feel as though they just fought a war in order to get that land, and now the king won't let them go in. He passes the Proclamation of 1763, which disallows them from going over the Appalachian Mountains. This is just one of the reasons that will lead to the American Revolution, so take note of this for later. There are a couple different economic systems that exist in the New World as well. One of them is called the Ecomienda system. Indigenous workers worked for the Spanish in exchange for food and shelter. It's similar to the manorial system in Europe, but it was more extreme and harsh. The hacienda system was set up by the conquistadors, who were given land grants from the Spanish government, and it enforced coerced labor of the natives. During this time frame, there are also several different labor systems. One of those labor systems were slaves. This is an example of forced labor. They were brought over on the Middle Passage, which was a six-week journey from Africa and very brutal. This is also a part of triangular trade, where ships would go from Europe and pick up slaves in Africa and go over to the New World 
drop off slaves and manufactured goods, pick up raw materials, and go back to Europe. Another example of labor at this time were the serfs. They are attached to the land and have very little legal protection. Indentured servant is another form, and this is where the employer would pay for their transport in exchange for labor, most of the time for seven years or a set time frame. Free peasants could own their own businesses, work their own land, and then they pay taxes to the nobles. They also pay tithe to the church to support that. Nomads during this time moved around and lived off their herds. And a guild member would be a skilled craft laborer. This is mostly in Europe at the time. They start off as an apprentice and then they begin to work independently. Due to the transatlantic slave trade, demographic changes are happening in Africa. Most of the Africans taken for the slave trade were men, so this leaves an overwhelming amount of women in Africa. And they are forced to step into new roles of leadership. New social classes are also established in the new world to differentiate people, especially who have intermarried and are of mixed race. We'll talk about that more a little bit later in this video. 4.5 discusses the economic strategies used during this time. Due to the European colonies developing, a commercial revolution happens. This is a result of population growth, the opening of new trade routes, inflation. High inflation then causes prices to rise. Another part of the commercial revolution is the existence of joint stock companies. This is where a company is owned by several investors. So if all is lost, the investors don't lose their entire life savings. They all share the loss. They also share all the gains. Therefore, the liability is shared. An example of this is the East India Company. New belief systems occur because of syncretism. Santeria and voodoo, which mix African religions with Christianity. Catholic saints, who mix with the local holidays of the natives. And Sikhism, which is a mix of Hinduism and Islam. 4.6 discusses the internal and external challenges to state power. In a nutshell, resistance movements. One such resistance movement was led by Queen Jinga. She allies with the Portuguese to try to stop the slave raids happening on her people. She even becomes Christian in order for the alliance to work, however it fails. She flees west with her people and starts Matamba. There she grows it into a strong state and even offers safety to runaways. Another movement happens in 1774. It's led by a Cossack named Pukachev. He rebels against Catherine the Great for the poor treatment of the peasants at the time. She puts the rebellion down and tightens her grip on the peasants in order to get loyalty from the nobles. In the New World, there are several rebellions. One of those is the Maroon Wars. England defeats the Spanish and takes over Jamaica. Slaves and runaways then fight against the English in the Maroon Wars in order to win their freedom. This occurs in 1728, and the slaves and runaways fight against the planners there, eventually coming to a peace arrangement where they earn their freedom. Metacom's War is a struggle between the Native Americans, specifically the Wampanoag tribe, and the British. It happens in the New England states, and the British overcome the natives and tighten their control on them. Section 4.7 discusses the changing hierarchies and social system in the New World and the Old World during this period. In China, the Qing Dynasty is ruled by the Manchu, who are outsiders to China. They are less tolerant of Chinese culture and try to make their culture more dominant. However, most Chinese did respect them as legitimate rulers of China except in the case of the Han conflict. The Han are an ethnicity within China. They were forced to wear their hair in the traditional Manchu style, which was a braided pigtail. They refused to assimilate because this reminded them of the power that the Manchu held over them. The Qing ordered Han Chinese defectors to massacre the Han. Entire populations were wiped out during this time. The Qing also kept the civil service exams in order to have a merit-based type system in their government. In Europe, there was a power struggle between the nobles and the monarchs. Enlightenment ideas and scientific revolution ideas led to new ideas about people as well. For example, the Jews were a little bit more accepted during this time. Many of them were involved in banking and commerce. In the Netherlands, they were especially tolerated. In the Americas, new class systems are established. One example of that is in Latin America. The highest of these classes were entitled peninsulars, which means they were born in Europe. Underneath them were the Criollos, 
who were of European ancestry but born in America. The Mestizos were under them, who they were European and native ancestry. The Mulattoes were under them, they were European and African ancestry. And at the very bottom were the Zambos. They were mixed between native and African. Change during this time results in new technology, to further trade and exploration. The Columbian Exchange, of course, is a huge change, which we already discussed. The economic system changes. New colonies are set up. Benefits of expanding trade will build empires and states. New global economy and globalization is occurring. And the demand for labor leads to the creation of new social structures. And that wraps up Unit 4 of the amazing review, A Race to a Five. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you do so and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss a thing. Stick around for outtakes. And that's the definite, and that's the way mercantilism, the English, however, are there to, the English, however, the English, ah, the French and the British go to war over the British, the colonists in, this is where indigenous workers, this is where indigenous workers,